days the strength shall be in measure. Day by day, God gives to me his best. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Certainly we're going to see this morning you cannot stand without that day-by-day -day ministering of the Lord. Take your Bibles, if you, if you would, with me this morning and let's go to the book of Daniel. Daniel, it's in the Old Testament, right after the book of Ezekiel. All right, uh, and if, I, if you have a Bible like mine, it's page 981. Yeah. The book of Daniel. Daniel, wonderful story uh, that we uh, are very familiar with that comes from the example of Daniel. And that's Daniel and what? The Daniel and the lion's den. All right. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. Now, my son told me this morning, Dad, could you preach on something that I don't know? <laughs> I said, son, you're a smart aleck. <laughs> I think I get a little taste of what I was like to my dad. Uh, I, I just, it's got to be, right? Uh, I've told you about the time that I reminded my dad about uh, how long he was preaching, right? Uh, I don't remember where we were. I think actually he was preaching somewhere, uh, some kind of conference or something, and so he took me with him uh, when he did, and uh, I just told him before, before we got to church that evening, I just said, okay, Dad, you know, when, you're, when it's time for you to stop, um, if you look at me, I'll just, I'll just tap my watch like this. I think he thought I was joking. I was serious. I mean, I, I don't know how old, how old I was, probably around Jaden's age. And uh, sure enough, um, I forget that if it was, whatever, 8 o'clock, I felt like that was the time that, you know, service was supposed to be done. And I was sitting right down here where, where Daniel and Brother Rasby are sitting, uh, and, and, and he's preaching along, and he looked down at me, and I went like this. <laughs> and he, he almost stopped right there. <laughs> but he was still in the middle of the, you know, finishing up the message or whatever. And, and afterwards, he said, I can't believe you did that. <laughs> Dad, I told you I was going to do that, right? So sometimes our children are honest uh, with us and help us in our, our, our uh, occupations. Amen. Standing firm, standing firm. In the book of Daniel, we're going to see some examples here again to help us with this concept of standing firm. Uh, this, uh, I guess it was uh, last week, or well, a week ago from this past Saturday, uh, my sister and I took a class, and in that class, they told us a story uh, of, a, of a fella that was in charge of the security of a business that was um, housed within one of the towers during September 11th terrorist attack. I believe they were in the second tower. I forget exactly what floors they occupied, two floors of that tower. I want to say they were somewhere towards the, the top half, if I'm not mistaken. And this, uh, this particular fellow was the, the, in charge of all the security for that particular finance company. And a few years, <clears throat> I guess, prior to that, he had uh, established the fact with his bosses that they needed to run uh, quarterly drills and uh, in order for them to be prepared for any kind of attack or, you know, security issue. And uh, he was pushing very hard for that, and they were pushing hard back against that, saying, well, listen, you know, you're talking about two hours out of the day during the work time. We're going to lose all that productivity. You know, is it really worth it? And he stood firm. He essentially told them, if we don't do this, then you can find another security head in charge of security. And they said, okay, okay, okay. We'll do this. So they, they gave in to him. So he, <clears throat> with his company there, he would do these quarterly drills. 
And uh, in his mind, I guess uh, there had been an attack on the the World Trade Centers prior to 9-11. I don't really remember it, but it was a, a, a bombing of some sort. Yes, okay, and, 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 and he saw that, and of course, you know, there were some things that they, they did and put in place because of that, but he actually, from what I understand, predicted that the next attack would be airlines coming into the building, some kind of airplane airline. And of course, most people thought he was crazy, you know, well, whatever, you know. And so <clears throat> he would... He would have these drills once a quarter, and they would practice getting everybody out of the building. And, uh, you know, everybody, oh, they're just crazy, whatever. But he stood firm, and he stood firm. And he made sure that the employees of <clears throat> this company, that he was in charge of their security, he made sure that they knew what to do in the case of some kind of attack or some kind of disaster, some kind of uh, a negative circumstance that would come upon them. And so they were in the Tower 2, from what I understand, and again, you can check my facts. I'm sure the story's probably plastered all over the place uh, on the internet. But, but, but they were in, story, uh, in Tower Number 2, and when the first tower got hit, no one really knew exactly what was going on. Nobody really understood what happened. And so uh, they come over the intercom in tower number two and they say, look, we just had an explosion over in tower number one. We're not exactly sure what's going on. We don't know. Just remain in place. Don't go anywhere. Don't do anything yet. And we'll try to figure this thing out. We'll, we'll, we'll see what's happening, what's going on. And this man in charge of the security immediately said, absolutely not, get out. And he ordered all of his, all the employees that he was in charge of, he ordered every one of them out of that building immediately. Again, they occupied two floors of Tower 2. They got out. He went back in, trying to help some other people to convince them to come out. That's when the second plane came in, hit that tower, and the tower came down. That man stood firm on what he believed. Do you realize that every employee of that company made it out safe? Because he stood firm. Now, unfortunately for him, he lost his life, but you know sometimes losing your life is the cost of standing firm. And we've seen that as I've talked to you already from the book of Hebrews, from the previous generations of believers. And we're going all the way back to even Jesus Christ himself, that time frame when he lived in, you know, when he started uh, all the, when he started the local New Testament church and he was, he was getting those disciples up and ready to go. And he told them, look, here's what you're going to have to face. These are the things you're going to have to uh, experience. People are going to mock you. People are going to scorn you. People are going to want to kill you. People are going to want to destroy this whole thing about Christianity. But you, need to stand firm we saw it last week with Esther willing to stand firm in the scenario that the Lord placed her in uh, we've seen it so many other places in this scripture of standing firm with what God wants us to stand firm but but listen I want you to look this morning here with me at the book of Daniel and again we're going to see a man who was willing to stand firm on what he believed it didn't matter the circumstance that came against him he still was willing to stand firm now I've got three ideas that I want us to look at today and first one is this the opportunities to stand firm then we're we're going to look at the opposition when standing firm and we're going to end this morning with the observations of standing firm so the first thing here the opportunities to stand firm God gives us many opportunities to stand firm now listen I realize today that that I am not necessarily in fear of my life now I know if we were to travel around the world and we were to go to certain countries there are places that you should be fearing your life if you're going to let anybody know that you're you're a Christian, if you're going to do any kind of evangelism, if you're going to do any kind of preaching of Jesus Christ, then yes, you should fear for your life in those particular countries. In our country today, we're not necessarily in fear of our life, but I can tell you this, if you pay attention to any of the things that are going on, it's coming. 
Now maybe the Lord will return first and the rapture will happen and we'll get up there, but maybe not. Maybe we'll also go through some of the same persecutions that we've read about and that we've heard about. The question is, are you going to stand firm in it? Now here, when, when Daniel stands firm, we can learn some truths, we can learn some principles, we can learn some, some ideas of why he stood firm. But remember this, there's always going to be an opportunity for you to stand firm. Even if it's not necessarily in the face of giving of your life. I, 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 somebody told me there, there was an article, I didn't read the article, I didn't find the article, but somebody told me the article that they're, they're pushing really hard right now to uh, make any kind of literature, printed material, that uh, uh, states that some of these hot topics that we're facing in our, li our, our society right now, things like same-sex marriage, if it states that those things are wrong, things like uh, transgender uh, issues, you know, if you, if you feel like you want to be a man and you're really, God created you a woman, you can be a man if you so on, and you know what I'm talking about. They're trying to make printed material that states that, th that that's wrong or that that's uh, something, that, that that's a sin. They're trying to make that printed material illegal. Now, can you think of anything that's printed that says that that's illegal? Hopefully, every one of you have one this morning. What are they trying to do? They're trying to ban the Bible. Trying to make this book illegal. Are you going to still stand on it? Are you going to still keep it close by? Still live your life by it? See, that's the first thing that I think we can see from Daniel's life is we stand according to the commands of God's Word. We stand according to the commands of God's Word. Look at Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. I, I, I've, uh, the last two messages, I... I took so much time in reading all the scriptures, I, I really ran out of time at the end. So I'm trying to do my best to highlight. Again, just like the book of Esther, go home and read it. The book of Daniel, go home and read it. Now, you might want to stop around chapter 6 or 7, okay? Because then we really get into some heavy meat. Uh, but... There's some great things that unfold here and great things that happen. And I'm going to just try to piece them together to help us to have some things to take home and apply to our life this morning. But in Daniel chapter 1, uh, uh, we have this whole concept here again of, of captivity time frame, right? And uh, if you ever get a chance, try to find one of these timelines that help you to put the kings and the prophets together. Because uh, it really will help make a lot of sense. If you start with uh, King Saul and you go all the way to Malachi and you kind of place uh, the, the prophets in the time frame that they are and you can figure out when the captivities took place. It started with the Babylonian captivity, then the Medo-Persian Empire. They, they, they had a captivity. I mean, you, you see it the way that it comes to pass and you can see which prophet was involved, which time. It really helps you make a lot of sense here. And Daniel was one that, that he, he actually spanned, his life was uh, spanned the 70 years of captivity that, that was experienced. And so he made it through uh, the two empires, the Babylonian Empire, then the Medo-Persian Empire, uh, and, and was able to experience the, the kings and, and, and a couple different kings, a couple different rulers because of the time frame that he uh, lived. But remember, most of it he spent uh, in what we would phrase as captivity. Now, the kind of captivity that he had because of the grace of God that was poured upon him and the way that God was able to use him, it wouldn't necessarily been in a slave situation where he didn't have anything because God blessed him immensely in the midst of this captivity. But it's still... He, he, he wasn't in Jerusalem. He wasn't in uh, his homeland. Uh, I looked around a little bit trying to figure out exactly what time frame that Daniel, how old he was. And most people say that he was probably somewhere in his uh, teenage years, maybe 15, 16 years old when he first went into uh, captivity. But here in verse 9, we see one of the opportunities that Daniel is given, and we'll go back and look at a few other things. But in verse 9, it says, Now God had brought Daniel into favor and tender love with the prince of the eunuchs. And the prince of the eunuchs said unto Daniel, I fear my lord the king who hath appointed your meat and your drink. For why should he see your faces worse liking than the children which are of your sort? Then shall ye make me endanger my head to the king. Then said Daniel, 
uh, to uh, Melzar, whom the prince of the eunuchs had set over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Prove thy servants, I beseech thee, ten days, and let them give us pulse to eat and water to drink. Then let our countenance uh, uh, be looked upon before thee, and the countenance of the children that eat of the portion of the king's meat, and as thou seest, deal with thy servants." So he consented to them to this matter and proved them ten days. And at the end of ten days, their countenance appeared fairer and fatter. See, there you go. Some biblical aspect of being fat, right? <laughs> fatter in flesh than all the children which did eat the portion of the king's meat. Then Melzar took away the portion of their meat and the wine that they should drink and gave them pulse. Now, you say that's a lot of interesting words. What does that mean? Well, when they were brought into captivity because of the... Uh, well-being of these individuals uh, because of what the, uh, the, the, the Babylonians recognized in at least these four guys, all right? Uh, Daniel and his three friends, we know them as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Uh, but uh, when, when they saw them, okay, they brought them in with all the rest of the uh, wise men and the ones that were going to minister to the king. They're building them up. They're getting them ready to be able to be into the presence of the king. And they said, okay, we're going to give you the king's meat and the king's wine. You're going to drink it. You're going to eat it. Now, Daniel knew that that was contrary to the laws of his God that he was supposed to be serving. And so what does he do? Oh, well, I'm in captivity. I'm just going to go ahead and do whatever they tell me to do. What is the old saying, when in Rome, do as Rome does? Is that what it is? That what it is? Yeah? Well, let me tell you, when in Rome, do what God tells you to do. When in your home, do what God tells you to do. When you're out, do what God tells you to do. When you're, it doesn't matter, do what God tells you to do. See, here's what Daniel stood on. He stood on the commands of God. He stood on the Word of God. And so in standing for that, he goes to his, uh, the, the man who's in, in charge of him, the authority figure there, and he says, look, will you give us a chance? We want to worship our God, so we still want to live by God's standards. We want to uh, obey God's Word. Give us 10 days. Let's try it out and let's see what happens. And what does God always do? He blesses those who obey His Word. And when he states something, he states it, and it has good consequences that come with it. And so they were able to stand, and they were able to prove that God's ways are best. Now, the other guys probably griped and complained because they had to give the king's meat and the king's drink, and then they had to eat pulse. Does pulse even sound good to you? No, but it definitely was good for them, all right? I, whenever I see Paul, or hear the word pulse, what I think of is when my wife makes one of them smoothie things. And she puts this spinach and, and uh, what, what else she put in there, Jaden? All sorts of good, healthy things. And then she blends it up. And, it, oh, man, it looks like this nasty green mess of stuff. And then she says, here, honey, drink this. No, it's not too bad. What do you think of that pulse? You think of the, you know, all this vegetable stuff that, wow, is it really going to? But you know what? I know one thing. That stuff actually helps me in in my health versus that nice big bowl of ice cream with a chocolate chip cookie on either side of it with no we'll stop there right <laughs> let's stand according to God's Word here's another opportunity we stand against conforming to the standards of the world we stand against conforming to the standards of the world. Now, this is a big one for us today, especially even the Christian realm. We are, we, we are pressed, we are pressured to be like the world. But that's not what God's Word says. We are not to be conformed to the standards of the world. We're to be conformed to what? The image of Jesus Christ. Here's what it says. Look over chapter 3. I, I told you we're going to jump around a little bit, try to grab some highlights. But chapter 3 and verse 8. Chapter 3 and verse 8. Now this is not Daniel specifically. This is his three uh, friends. But you know this story as well, I'm sure, when they were introduced to something called the fiery furnace, right? An amazing story, wonderful story. And, and you can start there in the first chapter, I mean, in, in the first verse of that chapter after church today and read through it and all the things that happen and the way that, that it comes about. But I mean, we have quite a, a, a gathering of the kingdom, quite a gathering of all the, uh, the high uh, positioned individuals and they've all come together to see this uh, amazing uh, statue that Nebuchadnezzar has created who is now causing or calling everybody to bow down. We've got music and we've got uh, people and pressure of all sorts saying, 
men bow down to this idol. And these guys have a different, different idea. Verse 8, Wherefore at the time certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. They spake and said to the king, Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. Thou, O king, hast made a decree that every man shall, that shall hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, the, the, the psaltery, the dulcimer, and all kinds of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoso falleth not down and worship that he should be cast in the midst of the burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the providence of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. And you know what I say to that? Amen. I'm glad they didn't worship them. I'm glad they didn't bow down. But do you get the picture of everybody else doing it? Everybody else doing it. Samuel, stand up. Everybody else is sitting down this morning, except him and him. <laughs> how how you feel, Samuel? Uh. Yeah, that's how I feel every Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you ever? You can sit. No, stand. No, I guess. <laughs> you ever? You ever? Uh, um, you know, they call out the number of the song, and usually we stand when we sing, but the one particular time we sit, and you actually stand up with your book, and you're like right up here in front where Tom is sitting, and you assume everybody else is standing, and all of a sudden you kind of look around and go, <laughs> Yeah, you feel with that? Now here it is. These three guys out of all the other hundreds of thousands of people that are there are standing. Now you can't tell me that's not standing firm. What are they not doing, though? They're not conforming to what everyone else is doing. Now, folks, that is so applicable for our day and age, it's not even funny. We can't conform to the world. But, Pastor, I don't want to feel unique. Yes, you do. You want to be peculiar. Well, I don't want to be made fun of. Well, I don't want people to, I don't want to stand out. You want to stand out for the Lord's sake. You want to be different because that's what God has intended for you and I. Not to be conformed to the world, not to love the world, not to go to the way of the world, but to stand firm and be exactly what God wants us to be. But everybody else is. Well, then let everybody else do it. Don't do it. See, that's the idea that we got these opportunities to stand firm for God, and that is one of them. Stand firm by being different. Stand firm by not being conformed to the world. And by the way, I can prove to you from Scripture after Scripture after Scripture, that is God's will for you and me. Not to conform to the world standards, but to the image of Jesus Christ. Here's another one, though. We must stand in our communication of the truth. We must stand in our communication of uh, the truth. Uh, man, there's so many opportunities again for us to go on this one, but let's just go to chapter 4, and we'll look a little bit here in chapter 4. Uh, uh, you know, it's, it, it, again, I think sometimes because we're so familiar with these stories, that the impact of what really is happening, what's really taking place, is just doesn't quite set in on us because... Uh, we we just a little familiar with it, and we look at it from our own eyes. But you need to understand that, that like, like last week, when we're talking about Esther, I mean, she's standing before the, the king, uh, which we don't really have a good concept of the king whole situation, right? But he's not just the king. I mean, he's like the ruling power of the world at that time. And she's standing there in front of him, hoping that he's going to, Give her the, the right to be able to approach him. I mean, that's standing firm. Now, now here, Daniel, he, again, he's talking uh, to the king, uh, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, the one that's conquered all this area around. I mean, they are the reigning power. Okay? They're the reigning power. And, and unlike what our situation is where we have supposedly these checks and balances, a king was the sole authority. Whatever the king said, that's what happened. And so you really, if you watch how all the other people respond to the king, I mean, they were very careful. 
They didn't want to cross the king. They just wanted to kiss up to the king. They wanted to make sure and stay in good graces of the king. But it's sometimes that, that we see these people that stood for the Lord, they stood against the king. And here David, uh, Daniel, I'm sorry, stands in his communication of the truth, even though he's talking to the king. Look, look what it says here in chapter 4. We'll look at verse 24. Chapter 4, verse 24. Uh, the, King Nebuchadnezzar, if you, if you know the book of Daniel at all, he had two dreams. One of the dreams he couldn't remember. And so he told his guys, look, I want interpretation of the dream. And they said, well, tell us your dream. He said, I can't remember it. I want you to tell me the dream and the interpretation. They said, King, that's crazy. Nobody's ever required that. He says, because you guys are a bunch of liars. You make stuff up. He said, tell me the dream. I want to know what I dream. We can't do that, King. Come on. This is ridiculous. He said, fine, I'm going to kill you all. Well, that's a great way to solve your problems, isn't it? Just why, you know, it's like the disciples. Lord, just strike him with lightning. Amen. I like that prayer. Until the Lord says, you don't know what spirit you're of, right? Daniel, on the other hand, is able to stand up to the king and say, hey, the Lord's going provide to provide this. And the Lord gave it to him and he wouldn't stand. But this is a second dream. And now he already knows who Daniel is and he's already confident that Daniel's got the connections with God but look at, look at where am I where did I tell you to look at 24 hmm. look at verse 19 first then Daniel whose name was Belteshazzar was a stonied for one hour huh. that's an interesting word I looked it up is that what I I read that right, right? Everybody's looking at me like I've mispronounced it. Stonied. Actually, Nebuchadnezzar also was a stonied at one moment. But you know what, you know what happened? Nebuchadnezzar dreams his dream. Daniel says, okay, Lord, I need interpretation. Interpretation, the Lord gives it to him, and he goes, oh, my soul. I do not want to tell him. You ever been there? I know I'm supposed to tell you that if you die in your sins, you're going to go to hell, but I don't really want to tell you that. I know I'm supposed to bring up Jesus Christ right about now, but let's talk about the weather. Let's talk about how bad the Orioles are doing right now. Let's talk about... Uh, but am I going to communicate the truth? You ever had to tell the truth to somebody and didn't, didn't, just did not want to tell them? You're thinking, I know what they need to hear. I don't want to tell them that because I have a good idea how they're going to respond. That's what Daniel's doing. That's his, this hour of being astonished. Astonished. He could not believe what he had just saw. Could not believe the interpretation of this situation. But in verse 24, this is the interpretation, O king, this is the decree of the Most High, which has come upon my Lord the King, that they shall drive thee from men, and thy dwelling shall be with the beasts of the field, and they shall make thee to eat grass as oxen, and they shall wet thee with the dew of heaven, and seven times shall pass over thee, till thou know that the Most High ruleth in the kingdom of men, and giveth it to whomsoever he will. Now, knowing the little bit I know about Nebuchadnezzar, about that moment, I'd, I'd be expecting him to take my head off. Stop! You can't say that to me. Off with your head. Wherefore, verse 27, uh, O king, let my counsel be accepted, uh, acceptable unto thee and break off thy sins by righteousness. King, you're a sinner! <gasps> Are you crazy, Daniel? I mean, literally, have you just gone insane? Why would you say that? And thine iniquities by showing mercy to the poor, if it may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. I mean, this is, now I'm talking about this is the same king that in chapter 3 with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, when they said, listen, I don't care what you say, we're not going to bow, we're going to stand. We're going to stand firm and we're going to constantly stay. We're not going to conform to whatever else you want everybody else to do because we don't worship anybody except the one true God. When, he said, when they said that to him, he didn't even give him another chance. He said, heat that furnace up seven times hotter. Get, give me my strongest, my most valiant, my mightiest men and bind them guys and throw them in. 
I mean, his, his fury, it says that he got so angry that he was just beside himself. That's the same king that Daniel is standing in front of now and going, you're a sinner. Your iniquities are going to drive you into the wilderness. You're going to be like a cow eating grass. Your fingernails are going to grow really long. Your hair is going to grow really, and it's going to happen seven years. Can I tell you today, Daniel was standing firm on the truth. Folks, we have a drought of truth today in our society. You know, it says as, as we get closer to the end times, this is people, they're going to go to churches where, people, where the preacher is going to stand up and tell them what they want to hear. They have itching ears. Well, you guys want to go there too, don't you? <laughs> well, pastor, don't tell us what's wrong with us. Just, just tell us, hey, tell us that we're going to be blessed this week. Tell us that we're going to be, we're going to come into a financial treasure. Tell us that our life is just going to be wonderful. Tell us that we don't have to worry about any of these other things. That just, just tell us all about the love that you have for me and the love that God has for us. And, and by the way, God does love you and God does love me and I'm grateful for that love and He does have mercy. In fact, it's long, it's long suffering. It endures for all generations, but He also is a just God. Oh, wait a minute. We don't want to hear that. There's consequences for sin. Oh, we don't want to hear that. There's things that the Bible calls sin that people don't want to call sin. We don't want to hear that. No, folks, here it is. The reality is this. We must stand on our communication of the truth of God. Amen. Y'all are being a little quiet here this morning. Let's go to chapter 6, and I want to give you one more thing, and then hopefully we'll move on here. We must stand firm in our communion with God. Our communion with God. And I love this. If there's anything that's amazing to me about the story of Daniel is this. This one, this one particular aspect. I love the, the fiery furnace with Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego. I love him standing before the king and just telling the king how the cow ate the grass. Y'all don't get that, did you? He told him how the cow ate the grass, right? Because he literally was getting ready to eat grass. Yes. Y'all are really lacking today. <laughs> It's funny. Come on. And then I love how he goes into the lion's den and uses the lion as a pillow and, and, and all the things that happen with that. All right. But here's one thing that's so special about the story of Daniel. Look at this. <clears throat> Chapter 6 and what is this? Verse 1. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 princes, which should be over the whole kingdom, and over three presidents, of whom Daniel was first, that the princes might give accounts unto them, and the king should have no damage. Then this Daniel was preferred above the presidents and princes, because an excellent spirit was in him, and the king thought to set him over the whole realm. And then you got this whole thing of what these guys do to him, and trying to catch him. But look at verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, now what was the writing? The writing was the fact that he wasn't allowed to worship, pray to any other god except the king. When Daniel knew that that writing was signed, and he also knew the consequence of it too, right? You're going to cast into the lion, the lion's den. When Daniel knew the writing was signed, he went into his house, and his windows being opened in the chamber toward Jerusalem, he kneeled upon his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God. Now notice this last phrase here though. As he did aforetime. Now you know what that means? This was a habit in Daniel's life. I mean, this is just something that Daniel had been doing. I don't know how long. Years and years and years and years and years Daniel had been doing this. He goes into his house three times a day, morning, noon, and night. He goes, the windows are open. He's praying towards Jerusalem. 
I'm sure that he's looking and he's probably playing, praying for the, the, the Israel, uh, Israelites. He's probably playing, praying that God will uh, have mercy and bring them back and, and restore them as a nation. And, and I'm sure there's all sorts of other things that Daniel's requesting. But here's the thing is, Daniel had a very good relationship with God. And he stood firm in that to the point where they said, you're not allowed to do that anymore. He says, I don't care what you say. I'm still going to do it. Now, here's, here's, here's the typical situation that would happen today. All right, I've got a good established prayer. Well, I don't know if that's typical. Let's assume you've got an established prayer life, okay? Assume you're communicating with God. Let's, let's hear that you're talking to God and, you're, and, and God's talking to you. And you're reading the Word and you're praying and you, you and God are just doing well. And they make it illegal. You're no longer allowed to pray to God. Okay, that's all right. So you go in your house. And there's windows open where you normally kneel. And there's people down below that are kind of watching. And so you go and find a closet. Because that's what the scripture says, right? You enter into your closet. And you go into that closet and you shut the door and you look around. It's just me and you, Lord. Okay. And you change your prayer habit not out of obedience to God, but out of fear for what's going on out there. Did Daniel do that? He said, you know what? My God means more to me than their rules and regulations. I'm going to keep communion with God. I'm going to keep that intimate relationship and passionate relationship with God, just like I've always done. Lord, I'm not going to stop because they tell me I can't. Amen for someone who's willing to stand in their relationship with God. <coughs> i got to move on. You wake this morning and say amen. amen. All right, what did I say? The opposition when standing firm. I'm just going to give you this one quick because I really want to get to the last one. The opposition when standing firm. First of all, there's personal discouragement. <clears throat> personal discouragement. Uh, you can look at the scriptures later again, Daniel chapter 1, 1 through 7. You can see all the things that happened to them, but they're taken out of their land. They're taken away from where they live, away from what they know, their family. They're no longer with their family. Okay? You can imagine somebody's 15, 16, 17, somewhere in that realm. Again, I don't know specifically what, how old he was. It's a guesstimate, right? But you can imagine getting taken away and being put into a program in which you are now going to become the servant of a king and you're going to serve his cause and this is the same king that has come and attacked your land has brought your people into captivity so on and so forth on top of that he's given to the prince of eunuchs the eunuchs those of you that understand the idea behind a eunuch mm -mm. that's a little bit beyond what i would ever want Right? You guys really are tired this morning. Amen. Yeah. Listen, what are we, uh, amen to that. What are we talking about? The things that come against Daniel here should have discouraged him to the point that would have said, I am not serving God any longer. Lord, you have forsaken me. You have let all these bad things happen to me. I am not serving you. Isn't it amazing? I mean, we talk about the nation of Israel. One minute they're serving God. Next minute they're not serving God. One minute they're serving God. Next minute they're not. When they don't serve God, God brings the, the judgment and the consequences, right? To the point where eventually they go into captivity. But even in the midst of all that, he still has individuals who are willing to stand firm for what he says and stand firm on what they believe and stand firm for the Lord and praise God for that. Daniel's one of them. He says, okay, God, I, it, this is what's happened. I've become a eunuch now. All right, I got that. I'm going to serve this king. Okay, I got that. So I'll never have a family. I'll never have children. I'll, I'll just always have to be here and I'll do it. But I'll do what it is you want me to do, Lord. And I will keep serving you. That personal discouragement thing has caused more people to stop standing than probably anything else. The things that have come against us that said, I quit, I'm done, I don't want to do anything more with Christianity. I'm just going to do what everybody else does and we're just going to call it, well, one day the Lord will sort it out. Fully on that. Don't get discouraged today. Understand that God's ways are best and that standing for the Lord is always the best thing that we can do. Then there's those 
uh, pernicious dissenters. Pernicious dissenters, that's big words because I'm trying to alliterate. That's all it is, all right? What is it? It's those guys that came after Daniel. The ones that were jealous about who he was. Jealous of his position. Jealous the king liked him more than they liked them. Remember he said over the king, Darius said over 120 uh, rulers and then three over top of them. And Daniel was the top of those three. So essentially he's second under the king. Well, people don't like that when God's people get raised into positions of, uh, of leadership. And so they do what they can to come against him. They're the ones that formed the law that you can't pray <clears throat> to the, uh, uh, anyone but the king. And they're the ones that try to catch him. You know, it got to the point they said this. They said, we can't even get him on anything because he's such a righteous man. The only thing we're going to catch him on is something to do with him and God. Man, what a testimony. But those people still exist out there today. You know, there's some that come against you. Paul had them. Remember the scripture we read about Paul? Man, he said that guy, the coppersmith guy, he said, boy, he stood with it. He stand against me. He's done it so much that everybody else forsook me as well. But God stood with me. See, that's what happens. We got these people that, that are dissenters or against the word of God. And many of those people are ones that used to know or heard the, the, the word before. Those are the ones that sometimes are the worst against you for standing firm on the word of God. And you know why? Because by you standing firm, it brings conviction to their heart that they are no longer standing firm. There's the proud and powerful diplomats, Nebuchadnezzar, Belshazzar, Abeltazar, Abeltazar. You know the other guy that took over after Nebuchadnezzar? The guy that saw the handwriting on the wall? Yeah, Darius. All of these guys, wicked kings that Daniel stood firm against. And then there's the possible destruction. Possible destruction. Look at Daniel chapter 3, verse 6. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Verse 6, Whoso falleth not down and worshipeth shall the same hour be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Now we know the stories, right? God delivered them. God delivered the three, three guys going into the fiery furnace. God delivered Daniel in the lion's den. So you know what we say? Oh, I'll face the lion's den. I'll face the fiery furnace. I don't care. No, put yourself before you know you're going to be delivered and then say the same thing. In fact, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego even said, Well, king, we don't know. We may die. God may save us. But we do know this. We will always serve him. You see, that possible potential for destruction is a motivator to cause us not to stand. You ever asked yourself, what is it going to cost? I think of all the scriptures that talk about following the Lord, becoming dedicated to Him. Even scriptures the Lord used in my personal life when He called me into the ministry. You know, He asked Peter, He said, Lovest thou me more than these? And these was that big, huge catch of fish that they had just got which for Peter represented a whole lot of income. And the Lord said to me, what's it going to be? You want to go after the almighty dollar? Or you want to go into ministry? And I struggled with that decision. Oh, we all, all, I want to be, you know, not like a billionaire, just millionaire. And have it. But sometimes there's costs that have to be counted. And I praise the Lord that He provided me with grace to surrender to that call. Because I can only imagine the destruction that seeking to get rich would have brought in my life. Daniel faced the lion's den. Verse 7 of chapter 6. That's what they say. Whosoever shall ask a petition of any god or man for thirty days, save of thee, O king, he shall be cast into the den of lions. And again, because we know what happened in the lion's den, we draw back from that. But let me just remind you, verse 24. After the whole event happened and Daniel walked out of that lion's den unscathed, 
no, dis no destruction, no scratch, no m chew mark on his arm or anything. After he comes out, they throw those other ones in there, and it says, the lions had the mastery of them and break all their bones in pieces or wherever they came at the bottom of the den. Those were hungry lions, and they came after him. See, that kind of opposition might cause you and I to stop standing. The cost is too great. The consequence, I'm too scared of. So let me just hide out and not stand firm. The last thing I want you to see is this, all right? The, the observation of standing firm. And I know I'm hitting the top of your uh, paying attention level, right? Some of, you are, some of you are very well. Some of you are, I don't know, it's too warm in here or something. Just, yeah. I got to get some air going. Somebody back there, somebody ushers, is there any ushers back there? I think the ushers all went to sleep too, but can we, can we have some kind of air? Pastor, what happens? You see everybody tapping their watch in the church. They, <clears throat> <laughs> see, here's the wonderful thing about people falling asleep is they're not awake enough to tap the watch, right? <laughs> you know, here's the thing is I want you to stand firm. I want all of us to stand firm. I want us to be able to be those kind of believers, that kind of church, that no matter what happens around us, we're going to stand firm on the truth of God's Word. Amen. Here it is. The observations of standing firm. When you stand firm for something, get this now, it naturally results and standing against something else. When you stand firm for something, you stand against something else. I can give you example after example after example. I mean, obviously here in, in our story, Daniel, when he stands for eating vegetables, he's standing against the king's meat. Now, he doesn't say anything about the king's meat. He just says, look, I want to eat vegetables. But because he stands on that, he's standing against something. When Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego stand instead of bowing, they're standing for worship of God. Look, we only worship the Lord. That's the only one we bow down to. But by the fact they stand for that, they're standing against worshiping the idol. See, what happens is sometimes we feel like well, if I stand for that, then somebody's going to think I don't like them because I'm telling them that something's wrong with... Ah. Yeah, it is catch-22 sometimes, but here's the reality. We have to stand no matter what. And it gets people upset. Why? Because you're saying what they're doing is wrong. But you're really not trying to say that, but by the fact that you're standing for what's right naturally makes you stand against what is wrong. I've had people ask me, what kind of music do you listen to? How do I describe the kind of music that I listen to to you? I said, I listen to melodious, Christian, God-honoring music. Oh, what's the matter? You don't like my music? Did I say that? <laughs> I said, I listen to godly, Christ-honoring music. But what happens? Because I stand for this. I end up standing against other things. See? Don't forget that. They stood for eating the right food that made them stand against eating the meat and drinking the wine. They stood firm in worship, stood against the worship of other gods. Standing firm <clears throat> requires God's imparted abilities. Standing firm requires God's imparted abilities. You can see what God did in Daniel's life. Okay? He had an excellent spirit. He had all these things that God imparted to him that allowed him to be able uh, to stand. When God works within our hearts and lives, that gives us the grace to be able uh, to stand. And then this is the last one. Standing firm for the Lord requires inward desire born out of relationship. Look with me if you would, this one verse, and I'll finish with this. Chapter 1, verse 8. You want to know a key to the book of Daniel? Here it is. Standing firm for the Lord requires inward desire. Inward desire. 
if all of you, all, uh, if all what you have is outward, okay, it's the pressure of other people, it's the pressure of pastor, pressure of church, if that's all you have, your stand is only going to last for so long. But if you've got the inward desire that says, I'm going to stand no matter what, I'm going to stand no matter where, if I'm at work around all the other heathens that I work with and they're doing this and doing that, I'm not going to be participating. I'm going to stand because it's an inward desire that God has placed within my heart and within my life. If I'm, if I'm in a hostile environment, I'm still going to stand because an inward desire. If everybody else starts to, to forsake and they walk away and I'm just feeling like I'm the only one left standing, I'm still going to stand because of the inward desire. See what happened in Daniel's life, verse 8. But Daniel purposed in his heart. There it is. Purposed in his heart. He purposed in his heart. In other words, he already determined, listen, I know what God wants and within my heart I'm going to serve my God. And he says that, that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore he requested. Therefore he stood. Therefore he went forward and said, this is what I need to do because I want to obey God because I purposed in my heart. So if you get anything from the messages, this right now, here's what you need to do this morning. You need a purpose in your heart that you will 